Hi, everyone. This is Jaime Alejandro with the Arts Calling Podcast, the place where I interview hardworking, independent creatives in the literary, visual, and performing arts. We have a great episode lined up for you today, but before I get to it, let me throw in a shout out. I'm excited to tell you about Switchyard. Award-winning editor, journalist, and author Ted Genoways hosts Switchyard, a literary magazine podcast featuring eye-opening essays, moving fiction, soul-stirring poetry, and honest, thought-provoking conversation. Guests include graphic novelist Art Spiegelman, poet Natasha Trethewey, Maya Kobabe, and more. You can find Switchyard on all major podcast platforms. This is a literary podcast you definitely want to add to your rotation. Okay, so today I am delighted to welcome back to the podcast Richard Jeffrey Newman. He is the author of Words for What Those Men Have Done from Guernica Editions and The Silence of Men from Cavan Carey Press, as well as the translation The Teller of Tales, stories from Ferdowsi Shahnameh. He curates the First Tuesdays reading series and is professor of English at Nassau Community College. And today we are arts calling to celebrate his third poetry collection, Teshuvah, now available from Fernwood Press. It was so great to talk to Richard once again. It had been about a year and some change since we last talked, so lots to catch up on, but I hope that you enjoy it as much as we did. So without further delay, let's give him a call. Hello, hello. Anybody there? I am here. There you are. Can you see me? Hear me okay? Hey, Jamie. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this once again, round two. Oh, absolutely. So, Richard, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's really good to see you. How are you? It's good to see you. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay. You know. Life is life. That's right. That's right. How's the city over there? <laughs> um, things are okay. I'm I'm back. The last time we spoke, I don't remember. It was the summer, wasn't it? It was. It was. I was 2021. Uh, I believe April or May of 2021. So about a right. year, so almost I, a year and maybe a half ago. I don't remember. Maybe I maybe I wasn't teaching at the time. Maybe the semester was over. I don't yeah. remember. I was going to anyway, ask you. I'm, yeah. Um, how was your sabbatical? Because I think that's where we had left off, where you were about to go on a sabbatical to uh, do some translation work. The, sabbat the sabbatical was, um, so the point, the, the purpose of the sabbatical was to do a second edition of a book of translations that I published way back in 2006, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the, the translations of a, of a guy, classical Persian poet named Sadi. And um, I mean, the, the sabbatical was going well, <laughs> um and then and then um unfortunately my, my father died oh my goodness i'm at sorry that time. thank you i i appreciate that but having he he and his wife lived down in georgia and just having to travel back and forth and, mm. and with everything going on with that um he and i had a complicated relationship let's just put it that way mm -hmm. um and so i kind of lost the last third at least of the sabbatical i just didn't get as much work done as i wanted to um but some good work i got some good work done and i'm going to try i have about a chat book's length of work um that i'm that i think i can work into publishing and i have there's a publisher that that may be interested in publishing it so that will at least that will at least be out there oh good good you know, if not the full book that i had hoped to do hmm. And it's always a tumultuous time to be thinking about writing when there's there's family stuff going on and, and there's, you know, life happening uh, in mm -hmm. all kinds of directions. Mm -hmm. But um, does does writing lose its meaning uh, when when one is caught in those situations? Does it bring any relief or is it is it just another thing on the checklist? You know, another frustrating thing. Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, writing doesn't lose its meaning at all. You know, I. I have written in bits and pieces about my relationship with my father. Um, part of what happened when I when I went down to see him, I mean, he was he was 
on his um, he was on his last legs i mean literally his last legs mm -hmm. um when i went down to see him we took him my wife and i his my father and his wife were um they really liked to gamble mm -hmm. they really loved casinos and um so his 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 last bucket list wish was to go one more time to a casino so we went down and we took him we spent a couple of days at um cherokee casino in in north carolina um and you know i've written in bits and pieces about my relationship with him but but i guess two things about writing on the one hand you know writing is i mean it's 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 what i it's what i do right i mean at this point i i don't know that i wrote very much but i wrote mm -hmm. but yeah. also you know he's dead now which means that there's a, a period at the end of my relationship with him which means that you know now i eventually i will go back and write more in more detail about it yeah it's an inevitable act of processing right i mean just just having yeah. that that tool to go back to and uh you know again my my condolences on that but i i'd like to kind of get the ball rolling and and talk to you about your latest work which is uh which is Absolutely. really moving. There were there were some moments that really caught me off guard, and I love the way that you write. It's it's very uh, direct. It's it's very specific. And when I was reading some passages, uh, I don't know, it, it just caught me in the right in the right way. So I just want to commend you for it because I'm. Oh well, thank you. I'm not Jewish, but I I am spiritually confused, as as I may have rambled <laughs> on in the last episode. Uh, in our last conversation, no, I, and I, you know, I actually, I, 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 I don't remember that phrase you using that phrase, but I like it spiritually confused. <laughs> yeah. I like, that. yeah, yeah, okay with the ambivalence of of all that stuff. Yeah. But if uh, if you could share a little bit to kind of set the stage about your latest poetry uh, collection and and where it comes from, that would be appreciated. So this is my my third book of poems. It's called Teshuva, which is the Hebrew word for repentance. And it is etymologically, it comes from a couple of different etymological ways you can think about this. But one of the etymological roots is um, the verb to return. And and the idea, so I, I had a bit of a religious education. I was in, in yeshiva, I went to yeshiva from eighth through 11th grade. And back at that time, I wanted to be a rabbi. One of the things I thought I might be was a rabbi. Let me put it that way. I don't know that I, you know. Um, and so I took I took a lot of that stuff very seriously. And the idea uh, of of return as repentance, at least the way I understood it then and, and the way I understand it now is so if you if you believe if you believe in God and that there is such a thing as sin, and then, then sin is is self alienating. Right, you have in some way alienated yourself from whatever your I don't want to say true self, but from your let's say authentic, authentic self, the authentic spiritual self, or authentic ethical self is. And so the the process of teshuva is to return to that authenticity, so that you can then move on on with your life. Right, you come to terms with whatever the sin was with whatever led you to sin with what, you know, and, and, and there's a big distinction in religious terms between whether or not it is a sin that you committed against God or a sin that you committed against another human being. Um, that's, but I, I don't use, I, the, I don't use this is an author's note at the beginning of the book. I don't use the term in its religious connotations, its religious denotations. Um, for me, so Teshuva, so my first two books, The Silence of Men and Words for What Those Men Have Done, are each, let's say, rooted in my experience as a survivor of childhood sexual violence. And those those two books take that experience on in kind of straightforward and graphic and specific ways. They actually deal with the violence of abuse, of the abuse itself. But it's also about, they are they are also about how how that experience shaped my life as a whole. These are not, the books are not um, kind of survivor memoirs in poetry, right? Um, they deal, they are, the poems there, they're politically engaged, they're spiritually engaged, they engage with a lot of, a lot of things about my life. Um, 
there are a lot of love poems, especially in the silence of, of men, there are a lot of love poems. And so they, they engage with how that experience has shaped my life as a whole in relation to the world, right? I mean, in, in, in how, how, I, how I have chosen to live my life in the world, in connection with the world. So Shuva, this book, this third book, is for me kind of the completion of a trilogy. And so the question, the question that I asked, or I should say the question that emerged, because I won't, I won't pretend that I thought this through systematically. <laughs> right? The question, the question that emerged for me as I wrote the poems, as I read them, when they got to the point where I could put them into into some sort of a book form, the question that emerged for me was, okay, trauma, and in my case, sexual trauma, is also alienating right? It's also alienating. Um, ex- so what is it? What, what do you what is the process of return when you come to terms with the alienation of trauma? What is the interior process of return? Who do you come back to? Because, I mean, even if you even if you think about, you know, the therapeutic idea, and I, I you know, this sort of idea that I don't know if it's still as popular or people still talk about it in therapy the way they used to, but the idea of your inner child that somehow, you know, through therapy, you get in touch with your inner child, right? So there's a sense of return. My the question that emerged from me was, okay, who, who do you return to? What does that process feel like? What is the interior, the interiority, the interior experience of that process? And so for me, that's what the book explores. Yeah. Yeah. And I, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, this is, this is wonderful. I I really appreciate you setting the stage that way because for one, thank you for, for a lot of these author's notes. And there was a glossary as well, which was very, very useful for me to kind of go back and and reference and look through the, through the text and, and make sure to get more clarity. But it's funny that you mentioned this trilogy aspect of it, because it seemed that there was this huge component that may not have been the focal point of your work before. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. like you, you talk about faith and, and as you mentioned, but this being sort of like the the anchor of the whole collection um, uh, seems to be finalizing that the entirety of your perspective or, or at least for a season yeah. of your of your life. Um, but the way that you that you mentioned to return and to to go back to yourself in a way. Um, right. Is that different or was a question uh, of returning, uh, figuring out how to put yourself back together first before you could return to yourself? Because I, I think that, you know, some folks who, who experience traumatic events, uh, perhaps, you know, sexual traumatic events might might have been completely undone emotionally. And so did you feel like that was a concern that you needed to put yourself together before you could return to yourself? Um. Well, I mean, you know, that's that's a hell of a question. Um, so, I, 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 I and I, well, let me start here and just see where the answer goes. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, my, I was, I was victimized when I was a, a young teenager. It's a long time ago at this point. Mm-hmm. It's almost fifty years ago, mm-hmm. right? It's almost fifty years. It's almost fifty years ago that that happened, and. I guess in my late twenties, I went to therapy. I started telling people, so men of, so I'm 60, I'm going to be 62 in January and men of my generation. And this is my understanding. I, I, I will, I have not made a close study of this, but my understanding is that men of my generation who are sexually abused or who have been sexually abused as children often wait decades to reveal. What, and sometimes don't reveal ever, right? Mm-hmm. Because because of the fear of stigma and all of that. Because um, you know, when we talked about this a little bit the last time, you know, to be a to be a man to be a man who has been sexually violated in some way, um, there's an awful. In some ways, men have more to lose by revealing. More is not the right term. In some ways, revealing is more fraught for men than it is for women, mm-hmm. right? Because, I mean, because for men, for, for women, in the heteronormative way that we, you know, society, right, women are, quote unquote, supposed to be pursued in this way, right? right? Um, and, and sexual violence against women is normalized. 
in society in a way that it is not normalized to think, you know, when we think about sexual violence against men. And so in some ways, a lot of, you know, for men, and I, I will say again, I'm thinking about my generation of men, revealing is that deeply fraught because there's questions of manhood involved, questions of, I mean, all of those kinds of questions, right? I told my girlfriend when I was 19 or 20, which is very, very early, right? Um, and then in my, in my, and, and I'm saying this just to sort of give a chronology to answer your question about quote, sort of putting myself back together, right? When I, you know, I told her and she was remarkably supportive. I mean, given, given the time period and how little people talked about that, you know, my experience, that kind of experience, she was remarkably supportive. And I suddenly, you know, it, was, it helped me stop feeling afraid. It helped me stop feeling so isolated. In my late 20s, I went to therapy, which, you know, has a lot to do with putting yourself back together, to use the metaphor that, that you used. I don't think I could have written any of the books before I was in therapy, right? I don't think I could have written any of them. And I certainly could not, would not have been able to write to Shuva without first writing the other two and making sense of mm. my place in the world yeah rather than my place within myself for want of a better right for want of a better term i mean one of one of the reasons that that the book is most except for the first poem right except for yom kippur 5780 um one of the reasons the book is entirely in the second person you know, is is that it was it it helped. It was a way for me to create some distance to talk about the exact process that you're talking. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, to talk about the process that you're that you're asking about with some distance, because it, it is a process that I, I I'm not going to say I'm not still going through it, but it is a process that at least the way what I talk about in the book that is in the past. I see. Right. It, you know, it, it's yeah. it, the book, you know, it's addressing, I mean, if you want to say that the you is me, like me, like I'm the poem, the speaker is addressing himself, if you want to put it that way. The you is in the past and is, is right. Yeah. If that, if that kind of yeah, makes sense. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be right. The you doesn't have to be you in the past in, in any of it. Right. I mean, however the reader, right. However the reader reads it is something else, but for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. For me, putting the book in the second person allowed me to write about that, the interiority of that experience. Yeah. So uh, the, thank you so much for kind of going through that chronology, because I think it adds a bit of a bit of clarity to kind of what you're working towards, especially since these right. seem to be so, so well connected. But if I may ask about your faith when you were younger, because I, I feel like maybe this is, as you said, a going back to those, mm -hmm. those earlier times. Why did you want to be a, a rabbi, if if I may if I may ask? Sure. So this is the way I have I have made sense of it retrospectively. I, I I you know I'm not going to try and recreate exactly what I felt and thought back then. So I was I always felt and and this is not entire this is not only connected to the sexual abuse. It's connected to other things that went on in my life as well. But I had a very strong sense of myself as being quote unquote wrong mm. in some way, right? Um, I was I was dirty or not worthy of certain things. You know, I, I just had a strong sense of myself as, and I'm, I'm just going to say wrong in quotes because I, you know, I I was ashamed. I mean, all of the things that come with that experience. Religion provides so Judaism. The idea in Judaism is that there are in the Torah 613 commandments that you're supposed to follow, right? And there's an entire, like, I mean, there's an entire now, I mean, intellectual history connected to what those commandments mean, how you're supposed to follow them, what, I mean, there's a whole, right, a whole intellectual history, but they are basically, the term in Jewish law, the term in Hebrew for Jewish law is halacha, it's halacha. Right, mm -hmm. which means the way. Mm -hmm. Right, it means the way. It comes from the verb to walk, or the right, and um, 
the idea that there was a that I could live according to I could live a life according to these principles and in God's eyes be good. Mm. Like if you live, you know, live your life according to these principles, this is my, you know, teenage whatever, yeah. barely adolescent yeah. right, understanding. If you lived your life according to these principles, well, you were good. Because God said live this way, God, you do what God wants, then therefore you're good. Um and being a rabbi seemed the logical extension of that, right? Because a rabbi, I mean, the word rabbi, it comes from the word for teacher. It's not like it, it, it comes from the word for teacher. A rebbe is a teacher, right? And so it, it seemed a logical, it seemed a logical extension of that. Um, and so for, and for a long time, when I was um, up until my early 20s, I guess, I guess up until my early 20s, I really thought I wanted to have, to live my life as an Orthodox Jew. I kind of fell out of, I, I, I left that behind, right? I, I, I left that behind for, there were a couple of different reasons. I mean, one, one had to do with my own disaffection with some of the, some of the metaphors mm. that, that in, in Judaism. So, so Yom Kippur, and this, this actually is a, is a thread that kind of runs through the book in a way, um, especially in the first poem. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, right? So this is the day when you are, right, you're supposed to fast all day and atone for your sins. But the metaphor of one of the prayers that you say, um, you, you know, you want to be inscribed in the book of life, not the book of death, the book of wealth, not the book of poverty. And it really sort of, the, the, one of the way I understood the metaphor, back then um it really kind of turns god into a bookkeeper right so you've got he's got a big book and he's got columns and depending upon you know you check this okay. off or check that off yeah. right and that just that turned me off mm -hmm. that 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 idea just really just really turned me off um but then and and i mean there's a longer story connected sure, to sure. that right yeah but then the other thing when I, I fell in love, I fell really seriously in love in my early 20s with a Catholic woman. Mm. And this presented a problem, right? Because, you know, there's no way that you can live, I don't care what your religious tradition is, but if you want to live your life, raise your family, have your family within that tradition, it's very difficult to do that if you intermarry. Mm -hmm. On a, I mean, on a practical, it's not, you know, on a practical level. I mean, right. Sure, this is a, sure. this is not this is not about um, um, by you know prejudice or bias in in that sense, but on a purely it's a practical reality. level. Yeah. Right. How do you live that life? You know, um, you know. I want to have an Orthodox Jewish home. My wife is Catholic. She wants to have a Christmas tree. Yeah. Yeah, and some might I mean, say they, that those are problems that that folks would go into and and troubleshoot in some way because people make it happen all the time. But it is a a problem that arises. Yeah, right. Well, well but the thing is, if you want to, it, it, there's a difference between if you're willing to come to some sort of compromise. Yeah. But if you really want to live according to the orthodox tradition of whatever faith it is, yeah, you want to raise your kids in that tradition, you want to perpetuate that tradition. How do you do that in an intermarried family, mm -hmm. right? right? Right, right. On a practical, on a practical level, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, listen, my I, I'm in my wife is Muslim, right? So I'm, you know, right now I am in a tradition family where we sort of meld tradition. Sure. I mean, she, she's not, and she is also herself not an Orthodox Muslim, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is a true, right? Yeah. Um, you know. Um, and so anyway, I, I, I was really serious, this woman and I, we were, we were together for about six or seven years in our twenties, right? So we were really serious. So the, I, you know, which is more important to me, loving someone who loves me and being able to love whom I want and, and be in a relationship with whom I want or this tradition, right? And so I chose the woman. I mean, I, not, I, I mean, I, I chose her, but I chose my, my freedom, mm. I guess. Yeah. Right. And, and, and my, you know, to be able to, to be with whom I wanted to be. Yeah. And so right. I, I, sorry to interject here, but that just kind of leads me to this idea of freedom within the manuscript, within the, the text that you've written, because I think it's, there's, there's a powerful through line of that. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm projecting something onto, onto this here, but um, there is, 
there seems to be a personal discussion about how you're reconciling the responsibilities with the freedom and and if there's if there can be a spirituality in, in there um is is that sort of a misread on when you say responsibilities what do you mean well sorry i guess i don't mean responsibilities but um <laughs> oh, so you you mean you mean you mean sort of the obligations of the it's tradition obligations thank is you it, appreciate it see i mean? told you <laughs> <laughs> so, listen it's a conversation it's a conversation um I, I think that's true. I mean, there's the one section. So there's the, there's, there's the one, there's the one, one sort of poem. I forget the number of the section in, in the last section of the book, the sentence in the sequence, the sentence is a metaphor for bridge, right? Yes. Which kind of talks to that directly. Okay. Yeah. Right. Which says, you know, when you arrived, faith pounced or something like that. Right. And you made yourself food. Right. So you, you, uh -huh. you, you gave yourself you gave yourself to the tradition. I'm just going to look up the... Yeah, yeah and I think that's exactly where it came from, yeah, because I, I reread that last night, and I I sat with that sure. moment. Um, if you could read it, I mean, I, I'd be happy to, to have you kind of... Sure. Yeah, if, if sure. you'd be interested. Sure, absolutely. So this is this is num the number 17 in the sequence. This sentence is a metaphor for bridge, which is the sequence that closes the book. When you arrived, faith pounced a mother lion with cubs to feed, and you made yourself food, rising from the muck of your survival, the scrape and grovel, the whining, the rage, to offer freely all the small prosperities you no longer needed. And when you stood before us, a child newly bathed, and there was no shame, then you knew that what you knew was true, and the path you took to get here, the agony and doubt each step forced you to endure, receded into silence. That's when you were warned, as we all have been. But when your time came, you convinced yourself love glistened the tip of every word your seducer spoke. You split yourself in two. Now one of you, and you will have to choose, must die. We, of course, will welcome home whichever one survives. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. That is so powerful, that, that landing of you split yourself in two, and that sacrificial nature that is inherent in faith, um, mm -hmm. I, I think is so, I mean, it's so moving uh, uh, to me, but if you could elaborate a little bit on, on how you arrive at that, that that grouping there, that conclusion, because it was really moving as we get close to the end of the book there. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it, it, for me, right. Um, what's interesting about, about the ending. So if you, if you enter a faith community, um, and, 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 you know, if you enter, if you enter a faith community, that is orthodox in some way inevitably you will be told at least at least i was you know i was told in yeshiva there are lines you should not cross right mm -hmm. i mean if you if you are in the faith and you are observing observing the tradition i mean there are lines you should not cross and i guess for me, I, you know, I was not raised in a religious household. When I wanted to be Orthodox. My mother was not at all religious. She was not at all interested in that. My grandparents were, you know, kind of conservative Jews, very involved in, in, in their Jewish center, but not, not to the point of like, you, mu you know, you must follow the tradition. You sure. must do all of that. So for, you know, I went, I, I gravitated towards that as, you know, towards being religious for my own reasons, like I kind of said, right, like I kind of said mm -hmm. before. Yeah. But I absolutely chafed at the limits <laughs> because, I mean, I had friends who were not Jewish. My life where I was living, where I was living, I think I was one of three Jewish kids in the entire, like, neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was in public school, there were only two of us in the whole school. Yeah. Right in, in my in my primary school, there are only two of us in the whole school, um, and I so I chafed at that, and 
I mean, I think people who are who, the people I knew back then would say, well, that's how I ended up with a Catholic woman, right? Mm -hmm. I was seduced right. by my love. They would say it was not a real love, I think, or they would say it's not whatever, not authentic or not, you know, sure. whereas for me it was, right? Um, but even as I was in love with this woman, it's not like I stopped having a Jewish identity. I didn't stop, you know, being Jewish, mm -hmm. right? So from the point of view of the community, I split myself in two. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Right from the point of the community. I mean, and there, are, there's a. I don't know if you if you have ever encountered them, but there's an organization called Chabad. They're a, a Hasidic. They're connected to the Lubavitcher Hasid. I mean, they're an organiz a Jewish organization, and what they try and do is bring Jews like me, let's say, back to Judaism. Mm. You know, so. So they'll they'll go around. So you, when you when you pray in the morning, you're supposed to put fill in which are like these phylacteries, these boxes on when you right. And if you go in Manhattan, um, you know you go by one of these, one of the one of their stations in yeah. Manhattan. They'll come up to you and say, "Are you Jewish?" Mm. And say, yes. Did you pray this morning? God really wants you to pray. Your Jewish soul wants you to, you know. So I mean, there is this, this sort of split, right? Right. 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 Um, they will not say that we will welcome home whichever one survives, right? Because obviously they're not, they, you know, or maybe they will because they will hope that even if the the one that has sort of left the faith survives, that they'll welcome you to try and bring you back into the faith. Mm. So I mean that that's in some ways like the the autobiographical context of that poem. I see. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I you know but I I can also imagine someone reading that poem and seeing it from a very different point of view. Right. And that right? And, and that it, was exactly my reaction because to me it really did feel like going outside of it was the sacrifice and in really um just the act alone is is a sacrifice and a burden to bear that is that is secret and must be must be reversed in some way but but there is a forgiveness that you land on at the at the end which at mm -hmm. least what I, what i perceived now if i could ask you about the the sections of the sequences that that you decided for the manuscript i sure. I, I do think do not wish for any other life is my favorite because as you're talking about ways to live and uh I don't want to say obligations, but but perhaps benevolent instruction. Um, I I thought that this was so mm -hmm. beautifully written, and uh, and it felt like 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 a collection of affirmations uh, written very elegantly. And I was hoping if you could if you could share a little bit about do not wish for any other life to begin with, and then maybe we could talk about how you decided on the structure of the of the collection because i thought it was interesting okay. that you had that three section layout right right so 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 i will say first that do not wish for any other life has been set by the canadian composer owen bloomfield mm. and there will be a world premiere performance in canada on April nineteenth, twenty twenty four, in Kitchener, Ontario, oh. by by an ensemble called the Blank Experiment. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. It's called right. They're a new music ensemble. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, I'm I'm <laughs> very very excited. He I, he he sent me a, a preliminary, ver kind of almost finished version of the score. Mm. Um, and it's it's really I'm excited by that. So do not wish for any other life. I, so, okay, I have, where do I start with this? <laughs> so every poem, okay, so every, every poem in this book, right, I, I have to tell a little bit the story of the genesis of the book in order to yeah. make sense of it. Every single poem in this book started out as either a sonnet or an attempt at a sonnet, mm. right? Because when I, when words for what those men have done came out, I was so tired of writing in the first person autobiographically about myself. That is a sort of palate. I mean, really, I thought of it as a palate cleanser at the time. Um, I, I, I decided I was going to write sonnets. They were going to be very strict sonnets. 
meaning you know strict iambic pentameter, um, hard rhymes. If I could, you know, I, I was not going to allow myself any slant or off rhymes, um, and they were all going to be in the second person, mm-hmm. and they were going to be explicitly anti-narrative. Because I was, into this, I mean, these were just my constraints, right? Yeah. yeah. I wrote a hundred and something of them. Wow. Right. Most of, I mean, the only only one of them survived as a sonnet, which is, you know, there's only one actual sonnet in the book. But if you look, especially at the two sequences, especially "Do Not Wish for Any Other Life," um, which is all iambic pentameter. I mean, it's all kind of strict iambic pentameter. But even in the sentence is a metaphor for bridge, which is the fourth section. Um, you can hear the echoes of the sonnet. I mean, you can hear the echoes of the form. At the time that I was working on this, um, I had also been working on translating a, a, a guy named Attar from classical Persian poetry. And Attar's work, he is, he is known, I mean, he's one of the big guys in the, in the Persian literary canon, but he is also known as a as a Sufi poet, mm. right? And his books are te- uh, teaching books for a Sufi practice. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so there's a there's a certain kind of didactic teacherly. Mm. I see. You should do this. You will do this. If you do this, this is what it means. Kind of tone to a lot of the uh, to a lot of of at least the book that i was working with which is called elohim Ameh, which means the book of god um and so a friend of mine told me that she in reading through the sonnets heard echoes of that voice Hmm. in in the sonnets right okay so the sonnets did not as I said, most of them work as sonnets, but there were some really, really cool lines, really good <laughs> sections. And what I, what I mean, what I did to get do not wish for any other life comes out of my kind of cannibalizing the sonnets, juxtaposing lines that I really liked and just seeing what happened. Yeah. I mean, it, it re- I mean, it emerged from play, mm. basically, right? It emerged, yeah. you know, I, I, it emerged from play. Um, and the 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 imperative, right? Do not wish for any other. Life. You know, as as I as I, once I sort of got the form of it, and I was playing with it, and I really started to think about the meaning of it, and not just the sound of it. Yeah. Right. So you know, do not wish for any other life is a way of saying, yeah, there are you know, there are issues. Life is hard. There are things you confront. There are you know, but you got to live the life you're given. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, do not, you know, if you wish for another life, you're basically not living the life you're given. You're not dealing yeah. with whatever, you know, whoever you are, whatever you are, you know, you're not you're dealing doing it with wrong. that. <laughs> you, well, you know, just, you're, it's a, it's a denial, right? I mean, if you, you know, if you, if, right, it's a denial. If you're saying, I wish I had another life, I wish I was living another life. If, if, you know, because, because this is so hard, because I don't want to be this, or I don't want to deal with that. You know, you're denying the moment. Yeah. Right. You're denying. You're denying who you are, and so that's where the title of the sequence came from. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, there's. You're asking. I mean, to go through images, right? So there's there's the the there is the. Um, you know, in the, the very first section, the, the, the very last lot, the last line of the first section, you know, refuse the comfort of your own white skin. Right. Um, there's um, now, of course, I don't remember the <laughs> hard anymore. Right. But, you know, yeah, I think that's that explains so much about it, because um, when you bring them down to that size, they feel like an exaltation, like everything seems to to pop, you know, because there's for some reason, there's more white around the page. It draws your eye in and, and mm-hmm. with the format itself, it, it just really, it elevates and brings something out of you that, that I'm sitting there reading them very slowly, taking my time with them. And it feels like everything is a, is a punch to the gut in a way that, that for, for whatever reason, I, you know, and, and again, uh, that's the beauty of, of the, this kind of work is that, is that there's so much 
imbuing process, you know, when it, when it comes to this, but right. I think that it was so effective and, and, uh, oh, well, so you. special. Yeah. Um, but if, if I may, I got a couple of questions here, uh, to be mindful of your time. Um, can we talk about how you were able to work with, with, um, other writers perhaps, or was there a community involved in the writing of this, you know, people that you trusted in the reading of this manuscript and, and what that process was like? I mean, it, it's not, not very much for this book. I mean, I, in, and, and some that is, some of that is just, is a matter of practicality. I mean, there was, there was a writing group, a group of us from my, my college, we would get together once a month, once, you know, as we could, and we tried to do it at least once a month, Yeah. Um, you know, as a writing group. But then, you know, when COVID hit, it was really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, one of our members actually died from, you know, died oh. from complications of COVID after surgery. I'm sorry to hear that. And then, and yeah, no, thank you. And the, she was the the poet Pat Falk. I will do just to say her name yeah. because she wrote she was she wrote some some really lovely work. Um, and then people were tired, and it just became more and more difficult. So no, most most of this book. Um, did, it did not really come together with a writing group the way other things that I have written have. Mm-hmm. Though I do want, I, I do want to acknowledge, right? My my friends who I'm telling you about, but I mean, there are people who read it, and there are people who, you know, over the over the years of the poems coming together, who read pieces and that sort of. So yeah, I mean, in that sense, I had. Yeah, and so uh, just just to kind of uh, continue on this train of thought here, if you could share um, sort of the the closing thoughts of, of your completion of this, not, not what you're talking about, but just what, what is, what was the feeling of, of getting this out into the world? Because you just had the release, right? I believe the, the release party on was October 12th, right? On October 12th. The, the uh, was October 12th. Yeah. The official publication date was the 17th, right? Okay. Well, yeah. Congratulations on that, by the way. But, um, how, what I guess, you know, in, in, it might be too early to say what's the reaction been like, but I think personally, I, I'd like to ask you, what is the feeling that you're left with having put this out into the world? Because I think it's it's a very personal experience. I don't know if you're desensitized to it because you've already put out a whole bunch of books, but but what is the feeling that you're left with, you know, releasing this out into the world? For me, it's a it's a tremendous sense of closure mm-hmm. because I really do feel like these these the the for my for these three books are a trilogy. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. and this this kind of puts a you know puts a, a, a whatever a period or whatever. This is, so I I do feel like it's a sense of closure, and in fact the the poems that I am that I'm working on now are in many feel very different mm. to me. Um, not not so much in form or crap, but in content. I mean, it, it you know I'm, I, I feel th- there is a difference that I feel. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's the, that's the, the way I would characterize my, my basic feeling. I mean, I'm happy that the book is out, all of the feelings that come with, it's a real thing. It's in my hands. People are reading it. People are, you know, ask, you know, all of that is true. Um, but the, my, for, for myself, what I really am enjoying and feeling and valuing is that it's, you know, this trilogy is complete. I have kind of said what I have to say. I feel like, and it's, I can move on. Yeah. That sounds like, like, uh, like beautiful atonement to me, uh, in, in some way. <laughs> I think, I think it, it, there, there's just something beautiful about it. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's a beautiful work, but, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, uh, you know, how you and your family were doing given, uh, everything that's going on in the world. I know that there's some conflicts that are you know might be culturally of concern to you but i'm curious you know kind of kind of how you're feeling on that i know it's it's a lot to throw in here in the last couple of minutes and and that could be a conversation in and of itself but um you know uh, so you know i have i you're right it's it is it is a longer conversation right and and i hesitate to try and it, it, it's not that I'm afraid to answer the question, but, oh, but no, I, I, hesitate, I get it. I get it. Yeah. I hesitate to try and, and encapsulate it because you lose nuance. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So let me let, so, so let me let me see if I can give you a give you a sort of an answer. On the one hand, on the one hand, I am. So when I was a kid, um, I'm sorry, everything becomes a story. No, but, no, I love these. You know that, right? I, <laughs> I know. Um, but when I was, a, I remember when I was a kid, people would ask me, are you a Jewish American or an American Jew? And, and, and it was absolutely, and they would say, if Israel and America went to war, whose side would you fight on? Right. And it was, it was absolutely, a, a, you know, I mean, it's anti-Semitic in all kinds of different ways, right? But it was absolutely, you know, where, where is your true loyalty? Right. I won't deny that I have, that I, that it's hard, it's, I won't deny that it's hard for me not to feel symbolically that the state of Israel as a Jewish state should exist in the world. And I, and I emphasize symbolically, right? Because you look, if you look at, his, at the history of anti-Semitism, Everywhere anti-Semitism has been able to run its course, and I'm not just talking about World War II. Everywhere that anti-Semitism has been allowed to run its course, the end goal has been to eliminate the Jews, whether that was Hitler's final solution or kicking, you know, just kicking them out of a town or out of a country or trying to convert all the Jews in a place. I mean, that was sort of the, you know, the end point. And so it's very hard for me to, to feel, to know that history and not feel like, well, then where do Jews belong? But that's the feeling, right? Which is, which is very different from the political reality of what it has meant for, from the Balfour Declaration back in the early 1900s, for Jews to try and claim the land that was then Palestine that now, right, is a nation, is a nation state of Israel. Israel has been occupying the Palestinians since, 19, you know, since at least for 70 some odd years, right? I'm, whatever, it has been occupying the Palestinians. Have both sides committed atrocities? Yes, right, right. Um, we know that Israel is not, when I was growing up and I had my Jewish education, Israel was the, um, was held up to us as this somehow morally and ethically pure and righteous nation. That was, you know, this puny little nation that's defending itself, right? But we know from history that, in fact, even in the 1948 war, the Israelis, the Jews who were, you know, were committing atrocities. I mean, we know, we know that. I mean, historically, we now know that. Mm -hmm. Any occupied people has the right to resist occupation. I, I mean, that's, I just believe that. Israel's occupation has been violent, has been all, it, it is a military occupation, right? I, and, 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 you know, if you lo to lose sight of that fact is to, is to engage in a sort of willful ignorance, I think. Right, to lose sight of that fact as a context for everything that has happened. Military occupation is an ongoing condition of violence, even if there is no explicit violence. Okay. So having right, so having having said all of that, was I am I am I deeply, deeply sad? Do I feel for the Israelis who were massacred by Hamas in this attack? Of course. Do I think in those atrocities there is an element of Jew, Jew, hatred of Jews, not just resistance against Israel? Absolutely. Do I think that it is right? At the same time, though, how, how to say that without allowing that feeling to be weaponized against the Palestinians is complicated. Yeah. It, right. I mean, it really, it's, it, it, it's complicated, right? Um, because we do not, unless you're really paying attention, we don't see what Israel has done to the, you know, right. Yeah. The Palestinians, we, you know, if Israel is bombing a building and it, you know, because they're going after, after Hamas and people get killed, I mean, you know, the, the victors get to call that collateral damage that is unfortunate, but necessary. Whereas for 
the Palestinians. I mean, that's I mean, that's still their children, their loved ones, whatever. Um, my own response to the attack is that I don't know why anyone is surprised. Mm-hmm. I just don't know why any. I mean, it's my honest answer. I don't sure. know why anyone is. This is not a defense of Ham. I mean, I you know, Hamas is an organization is all kinds of problematic. I, I'm not defending Hamas. I'm not going to engage in this. You know, I mean, there are Hamas is is problematic both in its relation to Israel and both in in how it has governed Gaza. I mean, those are all true. But I find I don't understand how people can be surprised that Hamas would do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, you know, neither do I understand why people are going, you know, I mean, Israel is, from all what I can see, committing war crimes in what it's, in its response in Gaza, right? I mean, they are collectively punishing the Palestinians in some ways for this, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, people are not going to see what I'm doing with my yeah, hands. Yeah, you're balancing, but, balancing the two, yeah. It's, it's, but it's not even trying to balance or on the, the one two. hand it's and the, the other, yeah. Right, because there, because if you if you take the occupation as the context, there is no balance. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that then doesn't mean that it justifies. Yeah, and this is you know, and and again, I, I I've let you go on for a bit, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just really grateful for you taking the time to eloquently share that because I I think to have these informed conversations about it takes time and it takes proper knowledge of the historical context that is at play here Mm -hmm. because we don't get a lot of that and so i appreciate you kind of going through that and and giving us Uh, a bit of perspective there but because we cannot clip this we cannot do uh sensational you know things uh yeah about it we just have to have a conversation about it but i'll tell you jay i mean i have said this there are people who will, you know, disagree with the version of history that that is, you know, and and you know that I sort of gestured towards, mm-hmm. right? There are people who will disagree with that, but I will tell you, I have said this. I I have no doubt that there are that there are people I know, who I'm probably most of them Jews, who would would you know want who would see me now as an enemy. Or that, that's too strong. Who would see me as siding with, mm. right? Or siding against yeah. Yeah. Jews and Israel. I mean, right? I mean, there right. are people who would, you know, unsubscribe from my newsletter or you know, whatever sure. because I've taken because I've taken this position. Anyway, I no, but it, I don't know why. yeah, and, and it's, I don't know why it's, it's incredibly that, nuanced, and uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to to share that yeah. because I think. You have a, a specific point of view that I'm interested in because you you do come from a family that that is multicultural in nature that has probably a, a better understanding than most and um, you know I I respect what you have to say not just as a as a creative person but as a human being so um, I you know, let's bring it back to you for a moment um, I didn't get to ask you about the the process of collaborating with a publisher, finding a publisher, or if this is uh, a group of folks that you already had worked with in the past over at Fernwood. No, actually, no. I mean, actually each of my books is published by a different, a different press. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, So I, I mean, I just went to newpages.com, which is a wonderful resource for, for this kind of thing. Um, I went down the list of their publishers. I, I took all the websites of poetry publishers and, you know, and then I went through them one by one, went to each website, see what they, to see what they want, you know, what they're looking for, what they publish, how they publish. Um, my one rule that I have is I don't enter contests. Mm, that's, that's pretty solid, a solid rule. What, what made you decide that? Because I, I want people to kind of get a sense of, of so, what that decision. I've had, I, I've had this rule since since the silence of men. Um, you, contests, you spend a, if you if you really want to enter contests, I mean, and this I'm, I don't even want to get into the, the the question about who actually wins contests and and all of that. I mean, there's a really interesting article that was published in Poets and Writers that I mean shows statistically 
where the winners of contests come from and they, you know, MFA <laughs> programs. I mean, I, and I, I mean, that's a whole, that's a, that's a longer conversation also for myself. If you really want to play the contest game, you got to spend a lot of money, right? Back when I was submitting in the early 2000s, I don't know. I think the entrance fee was maybe 15, 20 bucks, 15, 20 bucks at most, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's 25, 30, $35 a pop. Okay. Back, so I was, you know, if you submitted back then, if you submitted, and there were a lot less, there were a lot fewer contests back then that there are now. But you could easily spend $150, $200 a year submitting to contests. And it is to some degree a crapshoot, right? Because, because at least, you know, to some degree, I don't want to, I don't want to paint every contest with the same brush, but to some degree it is a crapshoot, right? Because, and, and you know, you, you, you submit it, there's, the judge does not read every submission, right? So there's a group of people who winnow it down and they send, you know, the, right to the judge. And at least historically, and I don't know, I, you know, I, my my understanding and experience was that most presses that run contests they're not so much interested in establishing a relationship with the writer right mm. um there are some clearly who do and and you know but anyway but i i was a semi-finalist for the walt whitman award with with the silence of men and i thought okay i'm gonna that means i should submit right well the next year or two, I don't remember, um, I didn't get anywhere near even being a semifinalist in the contest. And so I said, you know what, I, why, I might as, I just want to get the, I want to be published. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, I did a search, Kevin Carey Press at the time did not even charge, a, now they charge a reading fee, I think, for, for new submissions, but it's not a contest. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I just, from then on, I just, you know, I, I looked for presses that don't, I, a reading fee I sometimes can understand because I mean, you know, nobody makes money off of poetry. And so, you know, I get, I get a reading fee, but I don't need the prestige of a contest. I have a job. I, you know, like, you know, contests are often stepping stones to, 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 to jobs, right. To recognition. You know, I, I was a tenured professor already at the time. I, I didn't need to. And so I, so that's been my rule about not submitting to contests, right? I want to get the book out, but I don't need the contest. So I, I went to New Pages. Um, and when I, when I came to Fernwood, I mean, I submitted to a whole bunch of presses, but when I, you know, Fernwood is a, an imprint of the Barclay Press, which is a Quaker press, They're in, right? And their their specific focus is on poetry that engages, broadly speaking, with spiritual issues, mm. right? N okay. Not and not necessarily Christian. I mean, it, it's not it's not um, denominational in that way. And so I sent I sent a sample. Eric Muir, the guy who um, who who runs the press, he really liked it. I sent him the manuscript. And he said he want you know he he accepted the manuscript and so that's how it happened. It seemed fairly effortless uh, the way you describe it, but I'm sure that there was some uh, hair pulling. And, oh, uh... <laughs> it is, oh no, it, it's it's no, it's not effortless at all. I mean, writing pitch letters is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you know, figuring out what you know, it's 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 much harder, I think, to come up with a pitch. You know, a quote unquote elevator speech, right? Yeah. For a book. Yeah. A book of poems than it is for a novel that has a story right 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 you have no, to get it's, more it's thematic is is that kind of what happens like you you can't go into the specifics you you just have to sort of focus on the broader themes right. of the of the collection right yeah absolutely um and so no it, it is absolutely not effortless but i i'm just you know i i think partially because i set those rules for myself mm -hmm. it becomes manageable Right, right, and, and and I, for myself, I find it 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 definitely alleviates the anxiety. Yeah, some of the anxiety. Yeah, I I kind of like that, but I I feel I I think what I love about the way that you go about your work is that now you have a set of parameters that you that you stay within and you understand mm -hmm. what your strengths are, and, and of course that comes with experience. And one of the things that I ask this a lot now, uh, probably not since uh, since we last spoke, but 
Folks don't like venturing into cliches, but I feel that there's useful mantras in in sort of like writer routines and process and that sort of thing. And and so I'm curious, you know, because you're an educator, I'm sure you have a, a slew of things that that have worked as guidance for your students in the past. Do you have any anything that that might be useful for people who are just starting, who who are not yet at that point of of being confident in their system. How does one find a system? Um, you know, by system, what do you, what, of, what do you, of creativity, you, you mean, a system of output of, of productivity and, oh. and knowing when to not submit to, to contests. I mean, is, is that just being patient? That's gotta be just patience, right? Well, I think, I, I, th- I think that, um, if you if you if you're not talking about publication, if you're talking about just you know what is, what is it to sit down and write, there are two things that I would say. One is you have to read. And 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 I, I am astonished at the number of people, students that I meet, young people that I meet who you know they want to write, but they don't really read. You know, um, and I don't care. In some ways, I don't care what you read. It's not about, it's not about, you know, you must read the classics and know this Western literature. It's not even what I mean. There's no way that you, I don't care what you're writing, whether it's a screenplay or a book or a poem or or a novel or a short story or an essay. Once you decide to do that for an audience, you know, for for an audience, once you want to do that for a public, there's no way that you are not entering into a tradition. Mm. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, I mean, there really aren't all that many original ideas in the world, right? Right. I mean, right. right. You are entering into a tradition. There's no way that you can know the tradition, know what that means, have some sense of who you are in relation to the tradition if you're not reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and right. you are uh, okay. So you remind me of something that um, I I guess when you speak of tradition, I I think of it more like artistic lineage, right? Where you have the people that you look up to, your mentors, the people that you know, informed your work early on. But um, you in the previous conversation that we had, you mentioned uh, folks like June Jordan, Philip Booth, uh, mm-hmm. E. Cummings as sort of like, uh, would you say that is the tree or that is the lineage where you come from? Or are there other people who, who influenced the way that you see your poetry or, or um, the ones that you aspire to still? Um, I mean, and, and <laughs> that could question. be, that could be a, you know, that could be a softball question. You know, who's your favorite writer growing up or who is the, who is the, the, who are the folks that you emulate um, to this day? The ones well, that I, leave a mark. Emulate isn't quite the right word anymore, but I can tell you. So, I mean, June Jordan is, is a touchstone for me. Philip Booth is a touchstone for me. A guy named Albert Goldbarth is, it was, was very important to me. Um, Robert Creeley was very important to me. Sharon Olds mm-hmm. um, was very important. Uh, the poet I, A.I. Oh, I was um, going to ask you about that because actually, and I'm sorry that that you kind of answered this question already in one of your blog posts. But when I when I looked at A.I., I was like, is he talking about A.I.? Is, is he doing experimental <laughs> poetry? No, 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 no. He was. <laughs> I, I, she, she was. Um, I don't know her. I don't know her life story, but she, I mean, I read her books back in the 1980s. Oh, okay. She's been. She was. I mean, she's. You know. I mean, she's dead now. But I read her book back in the 1980s. Um, but her work was also very, very important to me. Um, it, I learned a lot from her about how to tell a narrative. You know, how to how to render a narrative and render narrative detail. In a you know in a poem as a poem rather than you know as, as prose, um, there's a, a Japanese writer from the, named Yasunari Kawabata, who excuse me wrote a book. He, he has a collection of stories in English. The title is Palm of the Hand Stories, and that's microfiction before microfiction, long before microfiction was a thing. Really, wow. Yeah, I mean the, you know some of, some of the stories are a half a page. I don't think there's a story in the book that's longer than two and a half three pages oh, i love that that's great um but so i mean so i mean you know if you want to ask writers from whom i have learned that's a list but if you want to ask oh hayden carruth is one james baldwin i mean you know i mean yeah but if you want to ask if you're asking about like a tradition in which i see myself 
I tend to see myself in a tradition of politically engaged work. And, and, I, and I don't mean by that, obviously, Democrat, Republican, you know, political party. But sure. I mean, you know, I, I see myself in the tradition of writers who want to engage with politics, small p politics in, in the world, right? Um, and, and I will I trace that back 100% to June Jordan, hmm. to my experience in her class and, 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 to, and to learning from her in the class, but also just reading her work back then. Oh, that's lovely. So without further ado, I, th- I think I'd like to give you your Sunday back, but I, I really, um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you for the work that you've, you've written. This was a, a marvelous collection. And um, personally, I just want to thank you because when I started interviewing poets, which was that uh, April or May of 2021, right. there that's has, right. there, there is a clear delineation in my life when I started to understand poetry and I attribute that to talking to people like you, you in particular have been a great inspiration in leading me in the right direction. And so I'm, I'm just, um, I'm very grateful to you. And even though we just chatted a couple of times and I, and I read your, your work every now and then and your, and your, uh, your blog posts, um, you've been instrumental in getting me on the right path toward poetry. So very grateful. I really appreciate, I really appreciate that, Jamie. I really do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'll leave you be, I really appreciate your, your time. You know, uh, it's, it's really been a blast and thanks for connecting. It it really is a pleasure, Jamie. And, uh, let's be in touch. Okay. Absolutely. And you do the same. Take care. All right. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.